Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Everybody good? Good morning. I got a little good morning shout. Good to see everybody. Um, welcome to Fellowship Asheville. If you're outside or out in the lobby and you're uh, loafing, come on in. Make your way in. Um, happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Great to see you guys. Good to see you. All right, sometimes you get up here and you're just wondering, what am I supposed to say next? And uh, no, hey, hey, glad you're here. Uh, if you're new here or you, you're uh, maybe you've been coming for a while and you're not sure, you know, uh, what's next, we'd, we'd love to know who you are. We'd love to know your name and, and uh, put, a, put a face to the name. And uh, so you can do that a few different ways. Let us know who you are. If you're watching online, um, you can click on the link right there. If you're in person, you can scan a QR code. Uh, how many of us have made it the last three-ish years without ever scanning a QR code? Raise your hands. Anybody? Okay. Has anybody never scanned a QR code? Okay, great. We got a few people. Good. All right, if you don't, so I'm just going to say this. I'm not going to assume anyone doesn't know how to, but if you don't know how to scan a QR code, if you're in here, you can pull out your phone. Uh, the, it's that square with all the little dots. There's some on the seat back in front of you. Uh, you can scan that. It'll pull up your camera, tap on the square. There, a link will pop up. Fill out that information just so we can say, hey, and like I said, just know who you are. So you're not just showing up to church and then leaving and, and no one knowing who you are. And if you've been coming for a while and you hear us you know, talk about stuff on Sunday mornings, like during this part where we talk about the, the announcements and the stuff that happens outside of Sunday morning, and then as soon as you go home, you forget about it. Uh, there's this thing that we have now called social media, okay? So you can check that pretty much any time you're connected to the internet throughout the week, and you can find out uh, what we're doing as a church. So you can do that on uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we have a YouTube account where you can watch the services, uh, past services, and then we have on the Version Bible app, you can go to events, uh, do the location to Asheville. You can find us, Fellowship Asheville, and uh, see what the, you know, the text that we're preaching through uh, for the day and notes and things like that. And just uh, through the week, just stay connected with us and, and find out who we are. And then uh, if you came and you're prepared to give uh, and, and give back a, a portion of what God has given to you, a few different ways you can do that. Uh, physically, you can do that in the building. By the doors, we have boxes that say tithes and offerings. You can do that there. Or uh, you can text any amount, literally any amount, to 84321, and it'll send you a link to, to do that. Uh, or you can do it by mail, like in an envelope, and put it in your mailbox, and the mailman takes it, and that's how it works. And uh, we still do that a lot. We still do that. Um, but then if you're online, you can go to fellowshipashville.com slash give and give that way. And then, uh, hey, one, one thing that we all want to hear about is the, the first Tuesday of October, we're going to have a church dinner. I'm going to say that again, and then we all say amen, okay? We're going to have a church dinner. Amen, amen, amen. So we are doing a, a full-blown, like, covered dish potluck for the fall. And so October 4th at 6 p.m., show up with your favorite fall food. And if anyone right now is hearing the Holy Spirit tell them to make an apple pie, they, they, I'm going to affirm that in your life, that God is speaking to you, and you make an apple pie uh, for us to share together on October 4th. That would be fantastic. So um, I think... Please register for that. I'm sure we're registering for that. Register at fellowshipashville.com. So you can go to fellowshipashville.com and register there, and that would be great. Um, all right, the, the uh, Trish and, and Deepak are going to come up, and we're going we're gonna to go into worship this morning. And uh, as we go into worship, I just want to take a minute, and uh, we, we've, we've started this song, uh, our, church, our worship services with this song, a bit over the last few months. And, and I think it's, it's a really powerful song because... Uh, it reminds us uh, that, that whatever happened through the week, or maybe even this morning, you know, maybe you, you missed an alarm or you didn't set an alarm, or you thought you'd get up just by hitting stop on your alarm, and then you woke up an hour later in a panic, or with a kid yelling that they're hungry at you, or car wouldn't start, whatever it is. I mean, we have, and those are just kind of the, the, the simple things of life, but I mean, there are real life seasons and situations in life that, that feel like storms. And this song is, is about raising a hallelujah in those storms, in those times. And a hallelujah, what it is, is all throughout the, the Psalms and the Old Testament in Hebrew, hallelujah, if you raise an hallelujah, it's, it's to, to sing a praise, to lift a praise to the Lord. And so all throughout the Psalms, there's all these remembrances of what God had done in the lives of Israel and his people. 
and they would say Alleluia. But then when you put the the ha, the, the for us in English it's an H, but in Hebrew that ha it means you. So what you end up doing is you end up saying you praise with me, you praise. So when we say I'm going to raise a hallelujah here on a Sunday morning in church where we live in Asheville and we could be out eating brunch at a hundred different incredible places, we're coming here together as a people who have been called by Jesus and set apart to love him and worship him and follow him and be his disciples. And so when we sing, I raise a hallelujah, what we're doing is we're hearing each other's voices in this room and we're calling each other to praise Jesus no matter what's going on in life, no matter what's happening. And so then there's a part of the song where it says, sing a little louder. And that can, that can often, if you're not joining in, sound kind of an awkward part where you stop singing. But that's a great opportunity for you to close your eyes and sing and join in with a global, historic church of Jesus that, that goes across countries and cultures and languages and generations. And, and, and so, so as we sing together this morning, uh, before we jump in, we're just going to take a moment and just close our eyes just to be reminded that we are a people who have been called to Jesus, that, that we recognize this morning that in the midst of hurt and brokenness and troubles, whatever that looks like for all of us in our lives, that God's word tells us that, that he showed his love for us, that while we were still in this broken, hurting state, that Christ died for us, that Jesus came from heaven that he humbled himself to the point of a servant, dying for, the cr- for our sins on a cross, and then he rose from the grave, and he started that work of making all things right and all things new and all things good, and we've experienced that. And so right now, just take a second. You can sit down. You can stand up. You can put your hands out in front of you. Or you can put your hands in the air and just ask Jesus. Just posture your body and ask Jesus to remind you of that goodness of his truths, maybe this week has been a time where it's been really hard to remember that you are a child of God and that you're loved and accepted and redeemed and that he has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in you and guard you until that day where we get to see Jesus come back and fulfill all righteousness. Jesus, we're here this morning to worship you, to to hear from you, And I pray this morning as we lift up our praise to you that you meet us here. Holy Spirit, make your presence tangible and help us to grow more into the image of Jesus. Help us to love you and trust you more than when we walked in this morning and and be with us as we take it out with us today and back into our lives. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is. I raise a hallelujah and heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise 
As I was singing that song this week, just anticipation of worshiping uh, with the church, I was reminded of how when my daughter Hannah was very young, less than a year old, less than a year old, she reminded me in the middle of warfare and in the middle of worry and stress to praise. And you know, children can be great teachers. I see teachers nodding there. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to read to you. It's just a very short little. Um, entry I wrote in a journal. This is a book that I did for my daughter, Hannah. I did one for my son, Liam, as well. When they were very young and they couldn't journal themselves, I would write down some God moments they had where I saw them recognize God or feel close to God so that when they got old enough that I could read it to them, they would see that God would been, has been ministering his love to them since they were born. And it's really a beautiful thing to do. I encourage you mamas to do that um, with your young children. Um, so here's this little entry about how she raised a hallelujah in the presence of spiritual warfare. When Hannah was very young, less than one years old, I remember seeing her first recognition of God. Here's how it happened. I was getting ready for church one Sunday morning. Things were crazy, nerves were frayed. You sensed a, a, a sense of warfare. I stepped out onto the porch for a quiet moment. Hannah was in my arms. I remember calling out to the Lord, I really need your help today, Lord. Just then, a bright sun ray shone through the clouds. 
as I looked up, I said to Hannah, do you know who did that? She lifted one hand towards heaven and said, Dodd. (laughs) I smiled as I asked her if she knew that God was also her creator. Then she gave me a big grin and said, Dodd, again. I couldn't help but feel that she knew who he was and that he was the one who created her. Later that morning, I heard Psalm 8-2. And Psalm 8-2 says, From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. And so I want to encourage you this week, sing that song. Praise him, in the, praise him, raise a hallelujah in the presence of your enemies. Sing it with your children. Let them sing it to you. Sing it over you. And let this be something we continue through the week, not just at church. And as we go into holy, 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 I also want to encourage you. Sometimes our minds are racing, and you just need to not sing and just let the church sing over you and receive the truth and, and focus on that. And if you need to do that, do that. Um, but let, let us just worship um, instead of worry. <laughs> and praise him instead of be fearful this week. Father, we're here this morning to worship you because you are holy, you are perfect, and you are good, and you're kind. And Father, as we open your word to hear the words of your son Jesus on earth, make it as real to us as to the people that that heard him then, and so that we can go out and we can know that we serve a Jesus who is still alive and real and sitting at your right hand working in our lives for your glory and for the good of others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Thanks, y'all can have a seat. Uh, so glad to see y'all today. Welcome, Fellowship Asheville. I'm glad you're here, whether you're in person, uh, whether you're watching online, or as the case may be, listening to this later this week at some point. Uh, we're so glad to have you join in. Here's uh, what I have been praying for us today. Um, I've been praying for a very specific area for us as a church, uh, that as we go through God's Word, we will be able to identify a specific fear in our life. Maybe even something you didn't even consider putting that label on it, that label of fear. But I, I've been praying that we're able to do that and be able to lay that down and in its place pick up, pick up faith in Jesus. That's what I've been praying for us today. And so let's jump into our passage and let's see what I'm talking about. We're going to be in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. All right, and as you're turning there, I want to remind everyone that we are going through the book of Mark. All right, we started, I don't even remember when we started, and we're going to go till who knows, uh, I think Easter. Um, but you never know, we might, who knows. We, are, we extended it once, why not extend it again? Don't think we will, but you never know. But we're in Mark chapter 9, and here's what we're seeing in the book of Mark. The first few chapters were this, this question that was implied in, in, in Mark, the, the one that the Holy Spirit used to write this book. Those first few chapters answered the question, who is Jesus? Right, And so you saw Jesus teaching uh, the crowds a lot. You saw him doing these incredible miracles as he was showing the people that he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. This next section that we are in right now, the question that keeps getting asked is, what if? What if Jesus really is the Messiah? What does that mean? What is that, this kingdom that he's talking about? What Number one, what in the world is he talking about? Number two, what does that mean for me? And so you see Jesus transition from teaching a lot of, a lot of crowds to spending a lot more time with his disciples, not only with the 12, but those who have said yes to following him. And he keeps showing them this is what the kingdom of God is like. Well, today what we're going to see is we're going to see what it means to have less fear and more faith in Jesus. And less of those behaviors that are caused by fear. And what life can look like when faith in him is in their place. So let me see if I can help you identify a little fear here. All right? I want you to think back with me. <clears throat> For some of you, this will be a very recent memory. Uh, for some of us in here, it could be a little further back. Right? But I want you to think back to report card season. Right? Right? How many of you remember getting report cards? How many of you remember getting this? Because this, this, this fear that I'm going to talk about right now has a couple, of different letter, a couple of different levels. How many of you remember getting the report card and being a little bit fearful to open it up? Or in this case, click the email, right? Yeah. If that's the case, then this second level of fear has kicked in. Because you had to get your parents to sign it. Right? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you ever forged your signature's parent, your parent's signature, but I'll tell you it doesn't work. Apparently a fourth grader is not as good as a forger as he thinks he is, <laughs> right? But there was this other level of fear of having to tell and show your parents what you actually made in the class, Right? Right, That second level, there's this like self-talk that's stirring up. There's this, this fear of talking to your parents. Let's take this a little bit deeper now. right? Because I want to tap into something that, that maybe you thought, maybe you haven't used uh, this language, but maybe you have thought this. If you're a, a church-going person, maybe this thought has crossed your mind. Have you ever wondered if God will give you a report card one day? Right? If God will give you something where, where your behaviors, where your thoughts, where your actions, where your life is given a grade, basically, as good or bad. Like some of them, some of them you will excel in, right? Some of them, uh, there may be a needs improvement, right? Some of them may be completely failing. Have you, have you ever thought about this? If so, then I bet there's a little bit of fear there. Right? That same fear that, that we kind of giggled about with the teacher's report card, right? 
I bet there's a little bit of fear there. Well, here's the question for us to consider. And I think it's an important question. But the question is this. What would God have on a report card? Right? If God gave you a report card at the end of your life, what would he actually grade you on? Would he, would he, would he care about math like my teachers apparently did? Right? Would you get the, 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 the I, I, I mean, here's what I imagine. If it was a report card like I always got, the talk successively would be checked. Because it was on every report card I ever got. I do remember there was one that didn't have it. My first thought wasn't, oh good, I did a good job not talking. My first thought was apparently an oversight on the teacher's part. <laughs> right? Like she just wasn't thinking when she actually gave it to me, right? What would be on this report card that God was to give us? Because here's the deal, church. Your answer to this question is critically important. As a matter of fact, I think your answer to this question is what will either induce fear or allow you to open yourself up to put the faith of Jesus in there instead and to live by that faith. Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at Mark chapter 9, verse 30 and see uh, what Jesus is doing here. So verse 30 says this. It says, And they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, he being Jesus. For he was teaching his disciples. And he was saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of man, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. So here's what Jesus is doing. Notice he's teaching his disciples, right? Because we're in this section of what if. What if Jesus really is the Messiah, right? And what he's doing is he's showing them what it means to follow him. And part of what it means to follow Jesus for his disciples is they get the inside scoop on his plan. Right? He's got his disciples with him and he's telling them, guys, guys and, and, and women that were gathered around too, like he's just saying, like, like here's how this is going to play out. I'm going to die. And I'm not going to die of a heart attack. I'm not going to die of a stroke. I'm going to die because people will kill me. But it's okay because I will rise again. Right? Now this information to the disciples was really hard for them to understand. It was really hard to let this plan seep into their souls because their anticipation, their expectations of the Messiah, right? Messiah is this, is this Jewish term, and it, and it meant, means the Savior of Israel. And their anticipation was that the Savior of Israel would, would, would put the nation of Israel back in its proper place. Because at this point in time, Rome was ruling over the nation of Israel. They were being oppressed by a foreign government. Right? And their idea was, was no, just, like, here's the deal. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to kick Rome out. Right? That's the, what the Messiah is supposed to do. You're supposed to bring peace by this raising up this army. You're supposed to bring peace through, through fighting and through warfare. As a matter of fact, to get a little bit ahead of ourselves, in Mark chapter 15, maybe you remember this. And, and, and when Jesus has gone through the trials before his crucifixion and, and, and he's been beaten and he's bloody, like I, I, it's right around then that, that he, the, the, the Rome stands him up in front of the Jewish people with another prisoner and gives them the option, you can release one of these men. Which one do you want? The other guy's name was Barabbas. Do you remember this? And, and, and in Mark 15, we see the crowd choose Barabbas, and Mark lets us know why. Because in Mark 15, it says that Barabbas was a member of a rebellion and an insurrection. See, Barabbas was doing what they thought a Messiah should do, right? Barabbas had rebelled against Rome, and he was leading an insurrection against Rome. And so they chose him because they wanted to give him a second chance to do it over again. Because obviously he's the Messiah. This is what the Messiah is supposed to do. This guy Jesus just keeps talking about love and sacrifice and death. You see, Barabbas was the, the savior they wanted, but Jesus is the savior that they needed. And that's what Mark is going to show us. And the disciples didn't know that the plan that Jesus just gave them, even though it wasn't the plan they wanted, it was the plan that they needed. 
But instead, look what they do. Watch this in verse 32. It says, they didn't understand, uh, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Right? So not only did they not understand their current thinking about what Jesus was doing, but their response to what Jesus said was fear. Now, what's interesting about this word fear is there's, there's different words for the word fear in, in Hebrew and in Greek. And, and this word is the word we get phobia from. There's another type of fear where, where you're in awe of what God is doing. And, and personally, I think fear, I think, you know, going from one language to English, you just have to kind of pick the best word. I wish we had a different word for that. Because when you, when you stand in awe of God, fear isn't necessarily there. It's awe, it's, it's, it's awesomeness, it's, it's, it's bigness, right? <clears throat> this word for fear, though, is the word we get the word phobia from. Like, it induced a phobia in them. And a phobia, here's what's interesting about a phobia. A phobia is an extreme or irrational fear of or aversion to something. Right? For example, phobia, an ongoing fear of something. Anybody Afraid of spiders. Yes, that's called arachnophobia. What do you do when you see a spider? Freak smooth out, right? What do you do when you're walking in the trail and walk into a web that obviously a spider is attached to? <laughs> right? You start flailing like you're on fire, don't you? Arachnophobia. Anybody afraid of snakes? Got a snake phobia? Yes, that's called ophidiophobia. For word people out there. It's fun. Anybody know what coulrophobia is? Don't let the name freak confuse you. It is nothing cool about it, right? It is the phobia of clowns. <laughs> and thanks to Claggy the clown that I saw at a when I was a full grown adult at a children's pastors conference, I now have a slight touch of coulrophobia. <laughs> right? Clowns kind of freak me out a little bit. Well, the disciples, every time Jesus mentions dying, it induces this phobia in them, right? It induces this fear in them where they want to avoid it, right? They have this aversion to it because this is what we do when there's fear, right? We want to avoid it. Those things that we want to avoid show us the things that we're afraid of. And I don't just mean spiders, right? I, I mean like conflict, if you're a people person and you're afraid of disappointing people, you avoid conflict, right? When we're afraid of, of, of failure, we, we avoid it. When we're afraid of truly changing our life for the better, we, we pursue comfort and we don't, and we avoid anything that actually causes us to change. When I was doing my, my counseling classes, I think this was Alfred Adler who did this, but he, he talked a lot about the best way to get over fear is to face it, right? That's how you get it ready. He said a lot of your anxiety, he did a lot of work with anxiety. And he said a lot of work, a, a lot of his work in anxiety showed that if, if the anxiety is centered around a fear, if you face the fear, the anxiety goes away. And, 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 and his ideas, like I said, if it was his, I didn't go back in my counseling notes and, and look at it because y'all can Google it if you want. But... This is true because we watched videos of this. That idea of facing your fear, taken to the extreme, we got to watch these videos of people with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And like, like what they would do to face their fears, to lower their anxiety, if they were germaphobes, they would lick dumpsters. You know what? They weren't afraid of germs after that. Because their greatest fear was, if I get germs on me or near me, and I'm not recommending you go lick dumpsters, people, right? <laughs> Or toilets, they did that too. Right. <laughs> right. Ugh. But what they realized is they didn't get sick. They didn't die. And that fear had less power over them because they did the worst thing they could imagine. And they were okay. This idea of facing your fear even, even made its way and, and has been part of the business community and leadership. Face your fear. Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book uh, where he used the story of David and Goliath to talk about business principles. And in it, he, he says that the best mindset is to be unafraid, to face your fear. 
But here's the deal with fear. That's why Mark is going to mention it. For those of us who follow Jesus, and if you don't follow Jesus, I want to tell you up front, this, you need to know this about Jesus, right? Because here's what we're going to see. Jesus won't let us get comfortable in our fear. Right? The things that we're afraid of, the things that we try to avoid, Jesus keeps putting them right in front of us. Right? Why does he do that? Not because he's mean. He does it because he's a good shepherd. And he meets us in that fear, and he helps shepherd us and guide us through that. He leads us through those places so we can confront our fear head on. Well, wa- let's watch the good shepherd do his work with his disciples. Look at verse 33. Verse 33 says this, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them. So now he's talking to to the 12 disciples. He says, What were you discussing on the way? Now this is what a good shepherd does. He Notice what he does. He asks a question. Right? A good shepherd asks a question to lead to a conversation. He's Jesus. He knows what they were talking about. And he was walking with them. I'm sure he heard them, right? But he starts a conversation. And look at what they say next. Look at what happens next. It says, But they kept silent. For on their way, they had argued with one another about who was the, what does it say? Who was the greatest? Right? They were talking about it this way. Jesus told them this. Hey guys, listen, I'm going to die. People are going to kill me, but I'm going to raise again, and it's okay. Like, here's the plan. They didn't understand it. It didn't fit what they were thinking. And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. But when you're the new president of Israel, like, who's going to be your vice president? Right? That's what we want to know. And here's what they did. What they did in discussing is who the greatest is. What they did is they created their own report cards for Jesus. Right? And then they they put each other up against them. And they said, you know, John is like, hey, y'all, I, like, I'm the artist. Me and Jesus, we get each other, right? Like we see eye to eye on a lot of things. This whole, this whole new kingdom thing, there's a lot of feelings going on. I'm all into that. Matthew, you're into numbers. Like, sorry, buddy. Right? And Matthew's like, yeah, I'm into numbers. Right? Like, like just wait till I put this genealogy together. It's going to blow your mind. Right? And they start rating each other about who the greatest is. And I guarantee you, the person talking always was the greatest. Because that's what we do with report cards, right? Right? We, We create report cards where we always get A's and everybody else gets needs improvement and failures, right? Because here's what fear does. Fear causes us to compare. Right? It causes us to compare ourselves to, to those around us. It causes us to create our own report card that we measure everyone else against. And y'all, if you've been in the church for a while, you're really good at making your own report cards. You've got scripture passages tied to them, right? And it's just the ones that you're really good at, right? Because what fear does is it causes us to create this system of approval where we get A's and everybody else gets needs improvement, gets failures, right? But what it allows us to not do is to not deal with the real issues in our life. It doesn't allow us to see those places where we we fail, right? Because we leave those fearful subjects off. What is the question for you as we go into this next section is, is what does fear cause you to drop off your report card? Right? What does fear cause you to continually avoid? For me, working with the counselor, because I always said, yeah, I'm a people person. I just want to make people happy. And I had a counselor look at me and go, no, you don't. You're, you're not afraid of failure. You, you started a church in a recession. Like, you're not afraid of failure. And it's true. Like, like you can ask our staff. I love to start off a conversation with, so I have an idea. You know, like, what if? What if we did this? And, and usually the question come up is like, well, what if it doesn't work? What, do we do it again next year? I'm like, I don't, who cares about that? Let's just do it and see what happens, right? And so they affirm that, that I'm not afraid of failure. But what they said, which I was like, oh, oh, that's true. That's good. It's good to have good counselors in your life. Because what they said is you're not afraid of failure. You're afraid when people call you a failure. That's what you're afraid of. 
That's why you avoid conflict. That's why it's hard for you to receive feedback. Because what you're hearing is instead of your behavior being off or an area that you need improvement on, what you're hearing is that you are a failure, and so you're avoiding those. So see, I would leave feed. See, on my report card, there wouldn't be any space to leave additional comments. Right? What would be off of your report card? So you look back at the beginning of verse 34, because I love this. The beginning of verse 34, it says, but they kept what? Silent. Jesus asked them a question, they're like, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. We weren't talking about anything. What do you mean? Right? They kept silent. One commentator said the disciples were more interested in peacekeeping than peacemaking. They just wanted to keep the peace by keeping silent. What we know about Jesus is that he's not a peacekeeper. He is a peacemaker, right? Remember Peter a couple of chapters ago when he spoke up. Remember he, Jesus laid out the plan and Jesus rebuked him, right? Do you remember what Jesus called him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Remember that? I find it interesting that Peter kept quiet here. Right? That's called sanctification. He's learning something, right? But what the disciples would do is they wanted to hold the truthful answer in silence instead of letting Jesus speak into it. Because this is what else fear does. It doesn't just cause us to compare. Fear keeps us silent. Right? Fear keeps us silent. When somebody hits that subject that's not on your report card, your mouth just closes. Fear causes us to not speak the truth because we don't want to have to deal with the consequences, right? It causes us to, to, to keep silent because if we speak the truth, we might lose friends over it. Now, you also might gain the right ones, but you might lose friends. You see, Jesus isn't a peacekeeper. He is a peacemaker, and he's going to show them the report card of God. He's going to show them this is what God's looking at in you. Because what I love about Jesus is we talk about love and grace, but but Jesus still has standards, right? He still has commands. We're still to do something as a church. The deal with the kingdom of God in this what-if section is that Jesus keeps teaching his disciples, yeah, but the thing that you think you should do, flip that over. That's what the kingdom of God is like. Because what he's going to show them is that this report card actually brings peace. Look at verse 35. Verse 35 says this. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, if anyone would be the greatest, he must be the last of all and the servant of all. Now what Jesus does here, it's fascinating because it's going to be important in just a minute. What Jesus does when he says he sits down is he takes the position of a teacher. In in Jesus' time, when, when teachers would teach, they wouldn't stand up like I do. Right? That happened later because uh, as we gathered in places, if, if, if a teacher wasn't standing up, you know, everybody's looking around trying to get to the other person. We realized if we can stand up and elevate the speaker, then everyone can see, and that's good. I would much rather be down there sitting down, to be honest with you, but can't. Jesus did. Because that's the position that a, t- a, a teacher would take. They would open up the scriptures and they would sit down. And that meant, that meant listen and be quiet. So that's what Jesus is doing is he's sitting down because he's got something to say. What he's doing them is he's going to show them, listen, what he showed them is that, that if you want to be great, there's two things. Right? That fear is going to cause you to, to ask who the greatest is. And the answer is going to always be you. Right? Well, faith is going to allow you to see greatness in others. Faith is going to allow you to put yourself after them. Because instead of seeing your greatness, you're going to go around and see the greatness in others. John, you're going to look at Matthew and go, dude, I have never seen anybody as great with numbers as you are. I know you're working on this genealogy. I can't wait to see it. Do you know how many people are going to come to have faith in Jesus as their Messiah because of of who you are? And Matthew's going to look at John and say, dude, like you're going to get all those people I don't even want to be around. Right? Because they start talking about stuff and I don't understand. You talk about visions and all this stuff. I don't get those. I get get whatever the Jewish, ancient Jewish versions of an Excel spreadsheet was. That's what Matthew understood, right? Faith allows you to see the greatness in others. 
See, and fear causes you to say, who's going to serve me? And faith causes you to ask, who can I serve today? You see, fear competes and faith serves. Fear wants to make you better than someone else, and faith moves you to serve someone else. But who? See, Jesus isn't done teaching because here's what he knows. He knows that if, if left there, right, like if, I, if, if Jesus just said, put yourself last and go serve, our natural inclination, because we're human, is to serve those like us and to be around those like us. Well, look at what Jesus does. Verse 36, he says, And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, I want to stop right here because here's what Jesus does. Remember, where, where is Jesus? Is he standing or sitting? He's sitting, right? And it says that he took this child. So that means there were kids running around, right? right? And he said, come here, come here, come here. And he took this child, and it says that he took him in his arms. Now, if you're sitting, there's two different ways that you can imagine this. I imagine as we picture this, we probably picture the same thing, right? There's, you could say that Jesus took the child in his arms and did this with him as he was sitting and just held him up. You know, we've seen it in The Lion King. It's fine. Probably not, right? It's much easier, and I think much more accurate, to assume when it says Jesus took him in his arms that he was sitting down, he put the child in his lap, right? And sat the child down. Now, what is the position of a teacher? Sitting. Trish, I loved what, what you shared up there about children being teachers, because that's what Jesus did is he let this child teach the disciples. And this child didn't say a thing. Just the fact that it was a child, Jesus put him in his lap. Now look at what he says, though. Look at what Jesus says. And he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Right? And so what Jesus is doing is, is this new child teacher, what this child is showing them is, is, is to serve people like this, right? Because kids, here's the deal with kids. Kids had no honor in society. They had no status, right? They were dependent. They were vulnerable. They were under somebody else's authority. When you draw a poster for who's great, a child would never be on that poster. And yet, Jesus holds this child in his lap and says, this is what greatness is. It's seeing someone like this and serving them. Right now, this would be a great time to cue the slide for Fellowship Kids volunteers, right? <laughs> but we already did that. But, but, but here's, here's what Jesus is doing. He's letting this child teach us something deeper, right? Right? That faith moves us to serve those that nobody sees. That's the greatness that we see in people, right? It moves us to serve those that nobody sees. Faith moves us to serve when nobody sees. We're not doing it to be great, right? And faith moves us to serve those that nobody sees because we see the greatness in others. Right? People ignored kids. They were, they were useless. You couldn't use a kid to, to move up into society. If, you were a follower, if you're a follower of Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that, is that we get to notice and serve those that most people don't see. Right? Like if you're single and you want to know who to marry, watch how they treat the waiter or waitress at the restaurant. Right? Be in the room when they make a phone call to customer service. Like the real person, not the, not the prompts. We can do whatever we want to the prompts. <laughs> the real person, right? Anybody else just go like, agent! Agent! <laughs> right? It's a recording. It's fine. Get it out. Because eventually there's going to be a person there. How do they treat them? Right? How do they treat the assistant, not the president? Because one thing I learned is that assistants rule the world, if you haven't noticed. Right? You get in with the assistant, you are in. Right? Church, do we see who few others see? Do you see them? Do you give them a smile, a, a, say a prayer for them, or even start a conversation with them? 
few weeks ago, well, probably now about six weeks ago, I was at a funeral of a teenager that passed away. Um, they used to live here, they'd moved to Florida, and they did a service here, and it was really cool. He had some health problems that, that kept him isolated from people, and um, he would be on, in online communities quite a bit, playing video games. He created some online communities of other people that, that for various reasons, were kind of housebound, particularly teenagers, and, 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 and he would see them. And his parents talked about how he would see the people that nobody else could see. And, and the dad was saying, you know, I'd look at my credit card and there's all these door dashes to Taco Bell that were all over the nation. And he walked into a center and he's like, what are you doing? He said, they were hungry. So I just sent them door dash. And he'd do Taco Bell. Why? Because that's what teenagers eat. Right? And his parents told this story of one day they were out and they were going to a doctor's appointment. And they, you know, their son was behind them. And to hear them tell the story, they, they turned around and all of a sudden their son was dancing with this homeless guy. And they were like, what in the world is going on? They, you know, let him finish and he caught up with them. He's like, what happened? He said, well, the guy was just sitting there. I didn't have anything to give him. So I asked him what his favorite song was. He told me, so I pulled it up on Spotify, and we started dancing to it. And like, in that simple act, he saw someone that everybody else was walking by. Y'all, that's what the kingdom of God is. That's what serving is. It's seeing those that very few people see. You see, church, if Jesus is our Savior, If Jesus really is the Messiah, then we get to serve those that few others see. And I don't mean starting a ministry. I mean smiling, saying a prayer for them, saying hello, seeing the greatness in them. Like theologians talk about this, that the image of God is is placed on every human. Right? No matter who they are, no matter what choices they've made, no matter where they are in life, they have the dignity of God in them. Right? And as Jesus followers, we get to see that. Right? We get to make peace with them. We get to smile with them. Maybe even dance as the Lord leads. I know. You're like me. You're like, ah, he probably won't lead that. It's okay. He might. Right? Now let me ask you, church, as Jesus talks about this, would you want to follow a Jesus like this? Would you want to follow a Messiah like this? Would you want to follow a Savior like this that helps you see those who few others see and to love them? Because if so, if you haven't said yes to this Jesus, let me tell you, he's worth it. He really is the good shepherd that meets you in your fear and shepherds you through it. He's worth serving, and he is worth showing you who few others see. And so if you haven't said yes to Jesus, then let today be the day you do that. I mean, like right now, pray, and it's just simply closing your eyes. If you want, you can keep your eyes open, but it's talking to God in a simple conversation. And it's saying that Jesus is my Savior. And I will follow him. And it starts there. Right? And so start today following him and living your life empowered by the Holy Spirit that he will give you. For those of us who have done that, because that's the majority of us. The majority of us here and watching online and, and listening, you have already said yes to Jesus. Yes to giving him authority of your life. Yes to to letting him shepherd you. Yes to letting him uh, be this connection between the God who loves you and created you. And for you, I have a dangerous prayer for us to pray this week. And if you're inclined, I'm going to show it to you. And if you want, like seriously, like if you don't want to do it, just keep quiet. But if you do, I want us to say this prayer together. Right? And the prayer is this. This week, Jesus, show me who I don't see and show me how to serve them. And so if you want, let's just close today and say that together as a prayer. So if you're willing, let's pray this out loud and together. You ready? 
So, Jesus, show me who I don't see and show me how to serve them. Jesus, only you can open our eyes to people that we don't see. Only you can show us how to serve them. And I pray that you do that in your precious and holy name. Amen. Now I'm going to turn it over to Amy, uh, who is also going to give us a little bit about what this means for our church and serving those few C and how you can be involved with that. Um, So like Fred said, my name is Amy Hinch, and I'm the Connections Director here at Fellowship. And part of what that means for my role that I joyfully get to do is connecting our church with our community, our city, our nation, and our world. Um, And part of that is that I get to intentionally open my eyes to see those around us, see those here, right in Oakley, see those in our community, see those overseas um, that others don't see. So today, I just want to invite you to see with me um, those that I've seen. Um, And my prayer is that as I'm going through just a few of the folks that we see as a church, um, my prayer is God would stir in your hearts to see others the way that God sees them. Um, So first, I want to start with a homeless gentleman. There's a homeless gentleman who calls our porch his home, um, and he's been living here for about a couple months, Um, and it's really sweet. You know, the first time I went and talked to him, he was like, oh gosh, am I in trouble? And I was like, no, no, not at all. You're not harming yourself. You're not harming others. We are so glad that you've chosen to choose this as a shelter. Um, We wish more for you if you want resources to find out how to get permanent housing. Great. And he's like, no, 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 I just want to stay here. So you, Fellowship Asheville, are providing him a shelter just through this building. Um, But the sweet thing about him is that, you know, there are hundreds of people that pass this road every day, hundreds. And I would say most of them never see him um, or most of them never stop to see him. And if they do, they turn their face um, because they're not like us. They're not like him. Um, They may not be like the person they want us to be. Um, But we see him. Um, We know his name. He knows ours. We know that, um, like, I go out and talk to him at least once a week, just intentionally, just say, hey, man, how are you doing? Is there anything you need this week? Um, For those of you who give toward the community pantry that's literally right out there, outside our door, it looks like a book, little library, but it's a food pantry. He goes and gets food right from there, and he knows that he can get food from there. So that's one way you are seeing someone who the world does not want to see right here on this property. Um, oh, next, I want to talk about Black Mountain Home for Children. So in Scripture, the Lord tells us to look out for the orphans. Um, and that's a big heart of who we are as a church. So that is why we partner with them. Um, and Black Mountain Home for Children are meeting children who are anywhere from birth all the way up through even college age. So it's not just the littles. They intentionally go all the way through and walk through life with them. This is the why that we do it. They are disciple making disciples they are a christ-centered foster care provider Um, and that goes from you know there's some homes on site where these families live kids are in with foster homes on the family and homes Um, there's an apartment complex for those who have graduated college or have gotten their ged and are working toward through their apprenticeship program so they are learning how to live on their own in an apartment how to raise funds how to work um, at black on home And y'all, this is just barely scratching the surface of what they do, but there's so much. So when we've been doing basket collections the last few weeks, this is why we do it. It's because this organization is pouring into the lives of families. They're pouring into the lives of kids, and they're showing them Jesus. Um, This is why we are saying yes to being part of their fall festival. Um, Their fall festival is coming up in two Saturdays, and we are simply going to man a face painting booth. Um... I would love to invite you to join us so that we can fully say yes to them. There's a lot of slots there. Um, But we're saying yes because we can just put a heart on a child's face through paint, and it shows them the love of Jesus, whether they know it or not. Um, If you are not art inclined, it's okay. I'm not either. But I can probably copy one of those little, there's 12 different face painting things we have on a sign that will help you. You If you can draw a triangle with paint, you can do it. Um, That's all that it takes. So it's really just a willing heart to see this organization who are seeing these children who aren't seen, um, who may just blend in with the crowd, but there's so much more going on in their lives that is so painful. So join us. Go see Maggie after the service. She's in the back um, just to help start seeing these kids that aren't being seen. 
Um, next, I just want to share with you what we're doing overseas. So last weekend, as we were sitting right here in worship, a Hurricane Fiona hit the Dominican Republic in Puerto Rico. Um, so as we are greatly sheltered, there was no rain going on, they are getting hit hard. Um, so we partner with an organization called Bold Hope, and they have missionaries on the field in La Romana who serves two different communities. Those two different communities are primarily made... Um, made up of Haitians. So it's Haitians who have crossed the border into the Dominican Republic looking for hope. Now I'll say there's a lot of turmoil in that. There's a lot of um, racial funk. It's the best way I know how to say it right here on this stage. So the Dominic some Dominicans look down on the Haitians. They don't want them part of their country. So many of these Haitians are living in what we would call modern day slavery. Um, but you know what? We see them, and we see them through the lens of bold hope. We see them when we go overseas and do mission trips. We see them through child sponsorships. So I want to invite you to see them with me today. Um, child sponsorships is an easy way that we can go in and help right now. Um, it's $45 a month to support a child. Those child's faces are right back there. They're going to be with Desiree and Jason after the service. Um, and to some of you, $45 may be a lot I understand it, but what if it's 15 bucks a month and you can partner with three other families to, to provide food, shelter, education, um, and then also English classes and classes about Jesus. They dive into the word each week with these families as part of the program that if you have a child in sponsorship, you were in classes learning English to help you find better jobs and to learn about Jesus because it is gospel-centered. Um, so it's not only providing your tangible needs internally, like physical needs, it's also providing that spiritual need. And the families there, um, I will let you know, they are all safe. Thankfully, God had mercy. Um, there are, there's a lot of wet items um, because some of the roofs were totally blown off. The roofs, their homes are made of sticks and tin, um, just like that, that graphic you're seeing right now. Some of the roofs fell off, but their lives were spared. So how can we go in and help? How can we tangibly do something right here? So there's stuff in the back for child sponsorships if you want to learn more about that. Um, and lastly today, um, I want to invite you to see one of our own. Um, so Madison Montgomery is one of our graduating seniors. So Madison, I want to invite you and your family to come up to the stage right now. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Madison. She is a faithful volunteer for us. All those slides that were happening earlier um, was Madison. She's been on our worship team faithfully for a while. We'll just leave it that way, that way serving us as a church. Um, she has also been part of our youth ministry, coming consistently through all the high school years, um, through different changes with youth ministry, but she's faithful. Um, her family is also faithful. Ugh, we're not going to cry today, but I might. I make no promises. But what I want to invite you in is to see her, because the last year and a half, God has been stirring in her life to do missions, and she has said yes. So she will be with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, um, for the next six months. And what she's gonna do is go through a discipleship training school in Kona, Hawaii. So yeah, we're sending her to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> but what she's gonna do through that is for three months, she's gonna learn about Jesus and learn how to be a missionary. And then those next three months, she's gonna go overseas and go see the people in the world. She doesn't know yet where they'll place her sometime during that, and see people who maybe have never even seen people outside their own village. She's gonna go see people and talk about Jesus to people who have maybe never even heard the mention of his name. And she's gonna do that. She's walked out of fear into faith and said yes, faithfully. So we are so proud of her. Um, and we cannot wait to see what God is gonna do in and through you. Um, so she leaves Tuesday. Today's her last Sunday with us for a while, and she will return in March, God willing, unless he goes on and calls you somewhere else afterward. Um, and I invited the family because this family is involved as well, and we want to pray for them. We want to pray for Madison um, because as, as Matt talked about last week, um, Jesus invites the children, and he lays hands on them and blesses and pray for, prays for them. So we want to do that today. We want to send her off well. Um, and Madison, I want you to know we see you, and we're not going to forget about you. Um, you've got this whole body of believers supporting you. Um, so if you know Madison, if you're a staff, if you're an elder, a deacon, or you know Madison personally, I want to come on and invite you right now 
to come up, and we're going to lay our hands on her and pray for her. If you are not comfortable with that and you just want to sit in your chair, just put your hand out. And if you're not comfortable with that, just sit and take it all in. Um, Because we're going to pray for what God is doing in and through her and bless her out well. And we are praying for her sweet family as well, who will miss her greatly. Um, So let me pray. Um, Jesus, thank you so much for what you are doing in and through this church, um, what you're doing in and through organizations like YWAM and Bold Hope and Black Mountain Hope for Children. Um, But right now, we specifically want to pray for Madison. Um, We thank you that you have called her to this next season of missions. Um, And we would just pray for all the details to go smoothly, the packing that still isn't done, um, the flights on Tuesday. (laughs) Um, God, would you make it smooth? Um, Would you make her time in Hawaii be one that is so fruitful? Draw her closer to you. Draw her closer to other friends that she's going to make, that she may have no clue who they are. Um, And God, just raise her up. Be that teacher where she can sit in your lap and you teach her all about what it is that you want to do in and through her. We thank you so much for her open heart to say yes. Um, And God, we pray for her family who's home, who I am certain will grieve her absence. Um, May you bless them. May you give them nuggets of hope to just to remind them that, yeah, their daughter and their sister is doing your will. Um, May you heal those wounds that may be felt there um, of separation. And God, I just pray ultimately that you would bless this entire family um, and all the many things that you have in store in the next six months. Um, God, would you remind us as a church to remember to see her, to remember to see her family, to remember to raise her up in our prayers whenever her mind come, whenever her name comes to mind. Um, God, may we just be blessed because of her step of faith. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God, um, thanks, church. Thanks for being what we are. Thanks for being like Jesus. Um, And I just want to invite you, just like Fred said, to see those who are unseen. And I want to invite you to open your eyes and join along with us of what God's already doing in and through fellowship. And God, that's it. Um, Have a great week. We will see you Sunday. Come talk to Madison and her family. See us in the back. And if you have any questions or if there's anything that you specifically want to be prayed for today, um, Jared Buckner and Matt King are on our prayer team today, and they can meet you right here up here in the front. Church, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.